No professional in any discipline is free from bias, but how it affects decision-making, especially decisions around a criminal suspect's liberty, is the topic of several years worth of research by Nina Zunda. Nina is a PhD fellow at the University of Oslo's Department of Criminology and Sociology of Law and a lecturer at the Norwegian Police University College. Nina joins us this week on the Forensic Focus podcast to talk in depth about her work. I'm your podcast host, Krista Miller. Welcome, Nina. Thank you. All right, so we'll start with um, um, what was it that first sparked your interest in cognitive bias and its implications for digital forensics? Well, I would say I got interested in cognitive bias many years ago through learning about the role of forensic evidence played in wrongful convictions, mm. uh, partly in, from the Innocence Project, probably, but also from cases from my own country where guilt biases seem to have caused one-sided and investigations and erroneous verdicts. So mm. this uh, sparked my interest for the mechanics and sources that uh, cause bias. And also reading uh, studies about bias decision-making in forensic disciplines such as fingerprinting and DNA. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised to learn how contextual information influenced the results at even source level uh, assessments, such as comparing a latent fingerprint to a fingerprint from a suspect. And this actually starts, uh, sparked my interest to find out more about how this could uh, impact uh, uh, digital forensic work. Uh, yeah, and I couldn't find any research actually uh, uh, targeting uh, bias in digital forensic work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I realized that there's a research gap here and decided to start uh, exploring it in my PhD project. Okay. <clears throat> so how, from, from that point, how has your interest evolved and been informed by current events, either in your work or in the world or both? Uh, yeah. From my own experience uh, was that there seemed to be little awareness within law enforcement about the impact of context and on decision making. And I've never heard anyone talk uh, about or warn about bias in digital forensic work. So instead I heard people talk about objective and reliable digital evidence and facts speaking for themselves. And I knew that there were many biasing sources in play from, from my own experience uh, with the investigative and forensic uh, work, either through uh, close collaboration and through discussions for agreeing and assignment and also many situational factors uh, such as time pressure and, uh, and uh, clearance pressure yes. and even exposure to emotionally disturbing content, mm -hmm. uh, such as child abuse material, which could amplify bias. Mm -hmm. So uh, knowing from my own experience, there's a, there's a magnitude of decisions that needs to be made during the digital forensic process and, uh, and taking account, into account all these biasing sources. Mm -hmm. I consider the risk of error quite high and, and need, wanted to know more about this in, uh, in terms of digital forensic work. Okay, <clears throat> that's really interesting. Um, so, I mean, from there, uh, we've seen a pathway in your work forming across peer review and hypothesis development and bias mitigation, among other topics. What is this body of work leading toward and what do you hope to see implemented on a practical level? Oh, that's a lot to say about that one, Krista. Uh, <laughs> If I was listening to the impatient part of myself, I would like to jump straight to the practical level, so to speak. Uh, however, I, I think uh, a successful implementation at the practical uh, uh, level depends heavily on some changes concerning mm. how we think about the digital forensic process and the evidence itself. Mm. So uh, from my point of view, there are at least three important issues that needs to be handled to ensure uh, success at the practical level and uh, that is how we think about interpretation mm -hmm. and uh, the second one is uh, how we think about bias blind spot and uh, the third is how we think about error i think so if i can elaborate a bit about those issues maybe yeah. uh, i think uh, for the first issue concerning interpretation i'm hoping to see a digital forensic process highlighting the practitioner as the most important analytical instrument mm -hmm. And I would argue that the role of the digital forensic practitioner has been put in the background, mm. often reduced to someone that finds and presents the facts, 
uh, and the scientific method and research based practices are are important, but uh, it's important not to adopt a very conservative positivistic view of the practitioner that has yet been uh, abandoned by by the scientific community so uh, I think objectivity seems still to be understood as uh, free from interpretation, and I would say that is a dangerous fallacy. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think actually uh, it's vital to acknowledge that the interpretation happens and that it's not an ugly thing. Uh, I strongly believe that the expertise of the digital forensic practitioner is, is necessary to obtain evidence and interpret what they mean for the case under investigation. And I think that by refraining from conveying your interpretation, there's a risk on the one hand that the decision makers don't understand the relevance of the finding. And, on the other, due to the lack of expertise, there's a risk that they misinterpret uh, the information uh, in terms of what the finding means mm -hmm. and, and the value of the questioned uh, matter. So, so I think mm, interpretation is a very, a very important issue here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I would say that in terms of the bias blind spot, uh, I often uh, ask my students about their attitudes towards bias and whether they believe that bias might influence uh, their own decision making. Mm. And still a high proportion actually replies that they don't think it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we still need to lecture digital forensic practitioners about biasing mechanisms and uh, implications for uh, the digital forensic decision making. However, I think the problem is not solved by lecturing alone. I think it's really important to go practical here uh, because having a little knowledge about bias can make you overconfident. So you need to, uh, and, and strengthening your belief on that you can uh, mitigate bias by mere willpower, for instance. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you need to go practical here and, and uh, uh, probably run practical investigation case solving to experience the bias yourself then I think you really know uh, or, or believe uh, and understand that we need the bias mitigation measures mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and uh, concerning the third issue I hope to see a shift towards uh, uh, the attitude uh, around error I think error is somewhat unavoidable in any process involving human decision making and instead of focusing on who to blame uh, i hope that we can view error as, as something we can use that is useful to us and hmm. um, i think the very few occasions where an error is revealed uh, it's it's an opportunity for the organization to learn so we can uh, of course, minimize the consequences by detecting the error, but we can also learn and we can correct systematic errors. So, yeah. so instead of looking for who to blame, I think we should have a shift uh, towards uh, seeing it as, as an utility actually for the organization. It's easier said than done probably, but I think uh, uh, this is a way of looking about error that could be more beneficial to also to digital forensics. So these points are, I would say, the uh, some pre prerequisites for successful implementation of bias mitigation measures. Mm -hmm. So back to our original question uh, at the practical level, I hope to see subjects involving um, uh, hypothesis driven uh, uh, investigations and also human and cognitive factors on the curricula for forensic uh, digital forensic education and training. And also I hope to see peer review and verification as, as uh, measures not only performed in a lab environment mm -hmm. and uh, regardless of where it's performed, I hope to see it designed in a way that prevents bias also for the peer reviewer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's what I would uh, want to aim for. So to that end, uh, you contributed, your research contributed the first documented peer review methodology in digital forensics. Um, is it being used that you know of? 
And there has been a pilot in the Norwegian police adapting the fourth level, which is uh, what we refer to as uh, conceptual peer review mm. involving reports. And I hope to run a pilot uh, in more police districts uh, next year, actually, okay. and hopefully also to involve law enforcement organizations from, from other countries. So okay, good. it's on the planning stage right now. Very good. Um, that's some. Um, so I, I imagine that this is you'll be writing it up for for additional um, um, published work. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's going to be be evaluated from a research point of view and and uh, and documented and and learning from from the pilots as well. So I guess it's going to be a a research or journal journal article of it when when we have conducted the research. Okay. Look forward to reading it. Um, your research, I noticed, also uh, consists of a lot of firsts, not just that methodology, but um, but others as well. Is this concerning? Should things like peer review um, and, and interpretation and error, um, I, I, they have been considered, but should things have been considered on a practical level before, or um, does this research reflect the maturity of digital forensic science? Well, everything becomes clearer in hindsight, right? So <laughs> it's easy to say that we, we should have known what we know now before, but I think uh, the research in the digital forensic domain has been very much affected by the rapidly changing technology environment. Yeah. So challenges such as increased volume of data and complexity and the novel technologies and user, user patterns has occupied most of the attention for the academics in the field. and. I think the maturation has been slowed down uh, due to the challenges the discipline has dealt with over the last two or three decades uh, on, on the effectivity level. So I think it's it's maturing towards uh, adulthood, but uh, but it's slowly, I think, and, uh, and uh, we're on the way. Okay, okay. What are some metrics that might help to indicate forward motion and effectiveness in implementation of these new methodologies, um, larger samples to study or, or other metrics? Yes, we need larger samples. Uh, we cannot study digital forensic practice without involving the practitioners themselves. So right. my sample was uh, 65 who agreed and 53 that com completed the experiment and uh, I learned that recruiting participants was really demanding in my research. So, but it's unfortunately not unique to my research. The NIST mm. Black Box uh, study by Barbara Gutman and colleagues mm -hmm. included, I think, 102 participants completed one of the two examination tasks. So, um, yeah, I think both mine and the NIST study include quite a small sample concerning the relative number of digital forensic examiners around the world. So. Mm. But the baseline here is that we need more uh, practice oriented research. So the samples we need uh, are defined by the objectives of the research. We sometimes need large samples uh, to achieve statistical power and in quantitative or experimental studies. Mm -hmm. But we can also have smaller samples in qualitative studies looking into practices from other perspectives uh, to, than to generate numbers and statistics, for example, case studies and mm -hmm. ethnographic studies and so on. So it's not only about uh, recruiting many, but I think to do more practice oriented research. Could your insights, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, um, your insights about practitioner processes be useful, again, on a practical level in qualifying expert witnesses, um, for example, hypothesis formation and testing or other evidence reliability safeguards? Uh, my research indicates that there is a gap uh, between the pra best practice guidelines uh, okay. and what they recommend and what is actually performed. Uh, and it also indicates that insufficient implementation of recommended practices or a partial uh, implementation, so to speak, is not effective. So for example, in the experiment, a large proportion claimed to have used hypothesis, a, a hypothesis-driven approach to maintain examiner objectivity during the analysis. However, the vast majority applied the approach as a mental activity, mm. as opposed to a structured and documented approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, since the results indicated bias, a plausible explanation is that 
merely thinking about hypotheses is not an effective bias mitigation strategy. So uh, in terms of qualifying expert witnesses, I think uh, we need to uh, conduct proficiency testing also, not for formal education and experience is of course an essential part of qualifying expert witnesses, but proficiency testing is key, I think, to, to know something about the actual skills of the practitioner in these uh, subjects. Okay, okay. I want to uh, go back to something that you said earlier um, about um, context. Um, I know in 2019, you wrote about the need for context in digital forensics, but then in 2021, your research showed that context introduces bias. Um, can there be balance? Can bias mitigation help with, um, help balance the two? Well, thank you for this question, Krista. And this is a really important issue. So I'm glad I can elaborate a bit. Uh, I think the findings concerning contextual bias are important, but I think also it's essential not to draw too hasty conclusions about right, which right. measures to apply to mitigate contextual bias in digital forensics. Mm -hmm. Uh, we should have in mind that although there is a substantial research base within the forensic science domain showing that context may lead, to friend, lead forensic examiners astray, this is the first study focusing on digital forensic work. So that's the first thing. And I would also argue that uh, digital forensics differs quite a lot from the majority of disciplines in the forensic science domain. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do know uh, uh, if we don't know if bias mitigation measures that are effective for, let's say, a fingerprint examiner are effective in the context of digital forensic work. So just mm -hmm. adopting measures without doing research on whether they work, uh, I think is a bit risky, actually. So mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, an intuitive measure would be to remove the task irrelevant context uh, for the examiner and thus remove the source of the problem. Mm -hmm. However, stating what is task irrelevant in digital forensic examination is not necessarily straightforward, I would argue. And, and we would probably need to consider it on a case by case basis. So stating something general about what is always irrelevant is not that easy, I think. Mm -hmm. And we also need to consider the bias that might emerge when exploring the context-rich evidence file. If you are having too little context to start off with, it's like walking into a library, I would say. Right. So there are some suggested measures, for example, the linear sequential and masking expanded by a drawer and colleague. And um, that aims to ensure that the information is evaluated before being informed about the context However, we need more research to ensure that it's feasible and uh, that it works as intended in, in digital forensics and, and that it doesn't uh, introduce other biases, for instance. So, okay. uh, so, so far, I would actually emphasize a structured hypothesis driven approach since it may not only mitigate bias, but also facilitate compliance with the normative obligation in investigative uh, or to investigate in a balanced manner towards mm -hmm. the, both the prosecution hypotheses and the defense hypotheses. And of course, also being transparent about the evidence uh, that relates to the hypotheses and the conditioning information that is taken into account and to allow for scrutiny. So to prevent that poor, poorly founded misleading results go under the radar. That's what we really don't want. Right, right, mm. yeah. Um, I, I actually have a question in a little bit about uh, linear sequential unmasking and, and other um, methods, but we'll come back to it. Um, in your 2021 paper on reporting, um, digital forensics reporting, you highlighted decision or legal decision makers lack of technical competence. How can they come better prepared to evaluate reports and processes um, as you're just de describing, as well as search warrant processing? Mm, yeah, in the complex uh, world we live, we need experts so yeah. with specialized knowledge, and and we will probably need even and more. And the legal decision makers are experts in their own domain, law obviously, and and cannot be experts. Uh, in in all the, the the expert domains they are are dealing with in court, I think so. Yeah. The main responsibility 
to still to to uh, to uh, for the expert uh, digital forensic expert to justify that the process was performed in a forensically sound manner and that the, the result can be trusted mm -hmm. uh, and to convey this in an understandable manner and this is of course uh, challenging to be both uh, clear and, and non-technical about this right. and conveying a very technical issue sometimes so yeah. Yeah. but i think uh, we cannot demand that the the legal personnel will uh, have the same level of expertise, obviously, as our own uh, experts. That said, a minimum level of knowledge should be expected for those mm. who are making legal decisions uh, involving forensic evidence at a regular basis, I think. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be an expert to ask relevant questions concerning procedures or to challenge the interpretations or evaluations of the results. Mm -hmm. And again, here, transparency is key. I think mm -hmm. accurate documentation concerning methods and tools and procedures is really important to enable them to, to ask these questions mm -hmm. and also to be, the, be transparent about the uh, error mitigation procedures that has been applied. So yeah. but my research unfortunately showed that such information very often is vaguely documented and often absent actually. Oh. So going um, back to what you were uh, talking about earlier, I mean, we're bringing in the um, the technical aspect of explaining all of this information. Um, that same paper described the Bayesian model of probability inference. Um, other uh, authors have talked about the application of likelihood ratios. You mentioned linear sequential unmasking and other mathematical constructs. So kind of on that same note, um, as the legal experts um, who are, are maybe not technical, um, is this realistic? Are those mathematical constructs re uh, realistic to introduce to juries? Well, um, my paper explored uh, what types of conclusions that was used by the digital forensic examiners. and. Mm -hmm. And that was due to the discourse in the forensic science community promoting the Bayesian okay. model of probability inference, such as like likelihood ratios. And I was interested to see whether this methodology was applied in digital forensic reports. Yeah. So uh, that's why I, I investigated that in my experience or, uh, experiment also. But I couldn't find any trace of such uh, conclusion types in my sample. So to your mm. question, is it realistic for juries? To be honest, uh, I'm, I'm on the, a little bit on the fence about this issue, uh, especially when it comes to jurors. I think the question here is whether we are comfortable with a juror not understanding the concept right. and basing their decisions on the question, do I trust this expert, uh, mm -hmm. versus whether we require that the juror's decision is founded on understanding understanding what the presented result is and uh, mm. yes associated limitations and uncertainty and and what it means to the question matter so personally mm -hmm. i think there are more jurors in the first category than the latter if they are presented to a numerical value also concerning digital evidence mm. and uh, what complicate this complicates this issue even more is that jurors are asked not only to assess the individual pieces of evidence, they are asked to evaluate all the evidence in context. Right. Yep. And that means, uh, in a sense, trying to appear as an orange witness statements, document evidence, and then these numerical values concerning forensic evidence. So considering the rule of law pr principle, the norm that supports the equality of all citizens before the law, I believe that it's important that those who make the decisions about whether or not to declare someone guilty of a crime should base their decision on actual understanding their, their relevance and the credibility and the value of the evidence. Mm -hmm. That's my, my personal opinion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think um, it's possible that part of the problem is, I mean, not with juries, obviously, but with um, um, uh, with all of all of the the, the bias and, and the issues that we've discussed here, um, that part of that problem is practitioners' own limits and knowledge of um, these different, whether mathematical constructs or or, or other um means of um evaluation um digital evidence certainty descriptors as you mentioned in one of your papers um mm -hmm. how to improve this knowledge um do we make it part of industry and vendor training to be uh, for instance 
Well, my impression is that the knowledge about the Bayesian model of probability inference is still not very widespread in the digital forensic domain. I think in general, more attention should be devoted to reporting and presentation of results, including interpretation and evaluation of findings. And I would argue that the attention in the training still is more focused on finding stuff. Yeah. yeah. Less about to document and present them. So I think there's room for some improvement uh, there to, to highlight the, the necessity of better reporting, actually. And uh, I think, actually, before we start providing likelihood ratios on a regular basis, there must be a robust underpinning to ensure that uh, the relevant results are obtained in the first place and that they are derived with sufficiently tested methods and tools and procedures and evaluated against the robust knowledge base. So from my point of view, I think there are many issues to, to solve and I'm okay. not sure if, if likelihood ratios is yeah. either the right starting point or the most urgent matter for the digital forensic discipline right now. But mm. Maybe for the future, it's it's relevant also to to include it into the into the uh, trainings from them, also from the vendors and and stuff. But I think for, we need to focus more on the reporting and not just generating automatic uh, automatically generated reports, but how to actually write them up yourself. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Sort of on a, a similar note, um, could tool vendors likewise support better verification towards improving pan, uh, transparency and making their products less of the black boxes that um, you mentioned a little bit ago in this conversation, as well as in two of your papers? Well, yes, as you uh, revealed, I guess I, I lean towards establishing trust through transparency as opposed to creating multiple impenetrable layers of trust <laughs> <laughs> errors related to both technical and non-technical sources. Uh, uh, open source code is an important measure for verification and to increase mm. the explainability, I think. So, so uh, and I think uh, we should move uh, towards, uh, towards uh, open source. Um, ah. But also, I think the vendors could assist the examiners by implementing effective logging functionalities, helping them to track their activities during the examinations at the analysis stages and, uh, and the functionalities for contemporaneous notes, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. In my jurisdiction, the digital investigation is done by the law enforcement on behalf of both the prosecution and the defense. And, the acquired image file would not be disclosed to the defense um, mm -hmm. and having access to informative contemporaneous notes would be very useful mm. for the defense attorney to overlook that the investigation has covered issues raised by the defendant at the pretrial stage. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So uh, going all the way back to um, uh, my, my earlier question about the, uh, the practical application of all of these measures, um, what do you think that sweeping changes would take? And I'm thinking of broad efforts to standardize the industry, like federal level accreditation requirements in the United Kingdom or the centralized Hanskin project in the Netherlands. Um... Yes. That's a big question, Krista. Yeah, I, know. I, know. <laughs> I think there is much to do. I think we, yeah. every time we open a door here, we'll find something to, to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, there's much to do on standardization and harmonization and, and increasing the scientificness, I think, within this uh, discipline. So there are many issues that need to be solved, both to ensure to be able to obtain digital evidence effectively and to ensure high quality investigations. So I, but I also believe that there are some cultural changes that also need some attention. For example, yeah. the attitudes towards the role of subjectivity and bias and how we think about error and so on. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't believe we can prevent all error. Uh, I think that we need error mitigation and peer review and verification yeah. on a case by case basis. And we cannot prevent ourselves out of these, these issues. Uh, accreditation may be a part of the solution, but not the solution. I right. Think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I think some of the feedback coming out of the United Kingdom at this point after two, three years of the process reflects that. Mm, yeah, definitely. So, and I also think that we need to define minimum requirements for being a digital forensic examiner. It's, mm -hmm. it's very, it's varying across the world right now. Uh, who, mm. who is 
who is an examiner and who is a novice or just uh, examining digital content. So we need to make a clear distinction on who is the expert here. And, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. because it, right now, due to all the well-designed software and products such as Handscan, many with very limited technological competence are able to, to review digital content and, uh, at the application level these days. And, and uh, that does not mean that they're able to understand uh, the limitations of the tools they are using and how to draw correct inferences mm -hmm. from the traces they encounter. So this is where the digital forensic examiner skills are really needed and, and uh, to understand the data structures and uh, to do advanced hypothesis driven examinations and, and un understand these limitations and uncertainties related to the procedures and, and the results. So, so I think uh, to defining the roles is also an important measure here to know who is actually the expert. Mm -hmm. So concerning sweeping, uh, Changes, uh, well, I would say there are some key issues that we already have touched upon. I think we need more practice-oriented research and, and we need to put bias and human error on the digital forensic curricula. Mm -hmm. I think we need to uh, apply error mitigation me measures that not only include technical error, but also human error. And uh, I think we should start looking at error as a friend. <laughs> Detecting them enables us to minimize consequences and also an opportunity to learning and, and improvement. So shifting the view could could be beneficial, I think. Yeah, you, you'd have to get past or, or encourage people to get past um, all of our, I mean, nobody likes to admit we made a mistake. So, you know, getting past that fear of, um, yeah. you know, the, the mistakes and, and any potential consequences would be really um, challenging, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, I think it's... Uh, and I think it's an organizational issue. It's yeah. not a, a personal issue for each and every digital forensic examiner. It's a way of, of organizing the work around error and it shouldn't be up to the individual digital forensic examiner. This should be a part of what we do, the part of the process, a natural part of, of you're not finalized the digital forensic process until you have done the verification and, and mm -hmm. checked for errors. And then you can deliver your, your product, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, Nina, thank you again for joining us on the Forensic Focus podcast. It's, it's been a really good discussion. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks also to our listeners. You'll be able to find this recording and transcription along with more articles, information, and forums at www.forensicfocus.com. Stay safe and well.